Good afternoon, folks. If everybody would take their seats, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome. Good to see all of you. I'm Eric Green, Director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, and I want to welcome you to this year's annual Trent Lecture. I'm going to just make a few introductory remarks about this lecture, and then I'm going to turn the podium over to NHGRI's Scientific Director, Dan Kastner, who will introduce uh, this year's speaker. Um, by way of background, for those of you who don't know this, uh, the intramural research program of NHGRI was started in 1993. Um, it started when Francis Collins was recruited to come here to be the director of the institute. Um, and at that time, part of the deal for him to come here was his ability to create, establish, uh, from essentially the ground level up, a new intramural program that would be part of the institute. For that, he recruited his uh, friend and University of Michigan colleague, Jeff Trent, um, to join him in moving to Bethesda and to be the very first scientific director for NHGRI, otherwise known as a director of the Division of Intramural Research. Um, and uh, to some extent, the rest is history. So Jeff arrived here in 1993 with essentially nothing in terms of an infrastructure for having an intramural program um, and uh, built one up very quickly. Uh, looking around, involving a number of you who came here as part of the first wave of, at that time, young investigators. You folks don't look nearly as young as you did in 1993. I, I arrived a year later, but I was, uh, I was essentially recruited about the same time. I uh, just delayed my move for a year and, and, and was able to watch firsthand uh, Jeff's ability to build a, a, a vigorous research program very quickly from the ground up. Um, Part of that was a combination of being really uh, wise and who he and Francis recruited to be the first set of investigators. And part of it was his incredibly good organization, management skills, um, good scientific taste, and so forth. Um, Jeff served as the scientific director from NHGRI from 1993 to 2002, and at which time he departed NIH to be the founding director of the Institute of Genome Research um, uh, uh, out in um, Arizona and uh, where he has continued to use his incredible skills to build research programs um, and be incredibly productive. Uh, shortly after his departure, um, I was appointed the second scientific director of NHGRI, and one of the very early things that I did was to find some way to thank Jeff uh, in perpetuity for his founding directorship of the intramural program, and I thought what he would like, and indeed I think he's told me he has liked the idea of making it scientific, and so we created um, an annual lectureship in his name. Uh, in fact, it's the only uh, annual lectureship we have at NHGRI uh, to this day, uh, and it basically honors his contributions as the first scientific director. So each year, uh, we look to invite a star in the field of cancer, uh, especially where cancer meets genomics. Certainly, these, this was and continues to be Jeff's passion, and it seems that every year we're successful at identifying uh, such a a first-rate scientist to come here, uh, tell us about their research, um, and really showcase uh, the exciting opportunities there are in cancer research, and especially as it um, sort of continues to grow and thrive uh, with uh, genomic advances. So that's the history, and I'm going to now turn the podium over to Dan Kastner, who's uh, going to introduce this year's Trent Lecture. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Eric, and it's my tremendous honor and pleasure to have the opportunity today to introduce this year's uh, Jeffrey M. Trent lecturer, uh, Dr. Joan Brugge. Uh, Dr. Brugge is uh, the director of the Ludwig uh, Cancer Center uh, at Harvard University and is also a professor of cell biology uh, at Harvard. Uh, Joan uh, did her undergraduate work uh, at Northwestern University and then uh, went to the hallowed halls of Baylor College of Medicine and worked with uh, Janet Butel uh, for her graduate work, uh, then going on to do her postdoctoral work uh, at the University of Colorado uh, with Dr. Raymond Erickson. She started her faculty career uh, at Stony Brook, uh, SUNY Stony Brook uh, University, uh, going on to the University of Pennsylvania as a Hughes investigator, uh, becoming the chief scientific uh, officer of uh, Ariad uh, Pharmaceuticals uh, before uh, 
uh, joining the faculty at Harvard in 1997, I believe. Uh, and at Harvard, uh, she was in the Department of Cell Biology and, she, and has been uh, ever since, uh, was the uh, chair of the Department of Cell Biology for 10 years uh, before taking her current position as the director of the Ludwig Institute uh, in 2014. Uh, she started her uh, uh, work uh, on cancer in earnest uh, as a uh, postdoc uh, studying the cellular homologue of the uh, uh, VSARC uh, gene, looking at it in terms of its role in signaling uh, and uh, looking at the HSP proteins uh, as chaperones uh, uh, for uh, the uh, cellular uh, SARC gene. Uh, went on uh, then to look at uh, integrin-induced uh, signaling and platelets uh, in the role of tyrosine kinases uh, in that process, uh, and then on to a very, very uh, uh, storied and productive uh, uh, career looking at signaling uh, in cancer. Uh, she is the recipient of numerous uh, awards and honors, uh, uh, including uh, the NIH Merit Award, uh, election to the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, election to the National Academy of Sciences and, and Medicine. Uh, so today, uh, she is going to be regaling us on another uh, topic uh, of, of great interest, uh, and that is uh, looking at the uh, TRPA1 uh, gene uh, and uh, the uh, calcium sensitive uh, channel uh, encoded by it in oxidative stress responses to cancer. So, uh, Joan, thank you very much for coming, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. It's really a pleasure to be here. In fact, it's an honor to be the Trent Lecture. Um, I think it's a real tribute to or testament to Jeff Trent's both good taste as well as his vision that the and HDRI has been so successful. And it's really been fun for me, not only to see old friends, but also to hear about science that I'm really not familiar with and just fascinated by um, in the discussions I've had this morning. So today I'm going to tell you about a story that um, started a while ago when, when I first came back to academics after having been um, in, uh, helped us uh, get a biotech company off the ground for a short period of time. And, and, there, and this project was initiated, uh, this project kind of was motiv motivated us, or we were motivated to tr use three-dimensional um, cultures in order to understand events that are associated with epithelial cancers. And um, I'll show you some early studies that kind of perked our interest in oxidative stress and then tell you, spend most of my time on a whole new story unpublished that relates to an, a, a, a um, protein that we never thought we would ever have any interest in whatsoever that actually has shed a lot of new insights into uh, mechanisms of oxidative defense as well as the role of oxidative defense in um, cancer progression. So this is a more general talk than just on trip A1, uh, more on oxidative stresses, uh, defenses in cancer. Okay, so um, this story started, um, as I mentioned, when we first started working in using three-dimensional structures to mimic the organization of cells um, in the normal breast in order to understand early events associated with, with tumor genesis. And one thing that we had noticed when we were studying, you know, just using these three-dimensional cultures is that when there were aberrant cells that proliferated even after these asini-like structures had undergone growth arrest, that if they proliferated into the center of the structure, they would die. And so we were being interested in early events associated with carcinogenesis, we we're interested in, in how, in fact, what would be the events that would be associated with the conversion of these uh, kind of hyperproliferative structures um, into structures in which the, se the cells would survive in the luminal space, since we saw that these aberrant proliferating cells would undergo cell death. So we, one of the major thrusts of our early studies was, first of all, to understand what causes the death of these cells. And then secondly, what types of oncogenic insult would allow these cells to survive in the center of the structure to form these carcinoma in situ-like structures, which look very similar to the carcinoma in situ that are seen in early, in, in, in one, you know, one type of, um, of um, epithelial um, tumor, glandular tumors. <clears throat> 
And so I'm just going to summarize what we learned. Um, and a lot of this um, was motivated by Jay Debneth, who actually got his research start here at NIH when he was a medical student. He did one of the two um, HHMI, or two year HHMI internships in Harold Varmus' lab. He actually worked with Pam Schwarzenberg. So Jay ended up going on to a pathology residency at the Brigham, and then he did his research in our lab. And I think it was really Jay's kind of keen pathological, uh, um, uh, or his keen um, sense of or, uh, attention to visual cues that really led him to provide some really interesting insights in what's, what's, what, what the, uh, the mechanisms of morphogenesis of these acini-like structures. So Mina Bissell's lab and um, Hinda Klinman's lab, also here, she's really the hero of, of, the, um, of these three-dimensional structures. And she worked out that if you put salivary epithelial cells into extracellular matrix gels, you could, form, for, you could generate these acini-like structures. But what Jay found is that um, he followed the mechanisms associated with the morphogenesis, um, which initially started as just the formation of a solid ball of cells and then underwent spatially and temporally regulated events that led to the formation of growth-arrested, polarized, hollow structures. And a key insight that Jay made was that the formation of a lumen actually involves selective apoptosis of the cells in the center of the structure. You can see here that these cells, this is in early stages when, here you see, you know, when there's a solid sphere, and then the cells in the center undergo apoptosis. And one thing that he noted in staining with a lot of different markers is that signals that are downstream of, from epidermal growth factor, which is the growth factor that's used in these cultures, after the cells underwent a polarization, um, the outer cells polarized and the inner cells didn't, the signals to activate um, signaling through the PI3 kinase and ERK pathway were specifically localized only in the outer cells. And we postulated that these inner cells that were actually deprived of integrant signals from the, um, after the um, extracellular matrix protein deposition became polarized such that only the outer cells received the signals from the um, integrant, that these cells were basically starved of survival signals and underwent cell death. So one of the first questions that Jay asked was, what would happen if we would prevent apoptosis? Would that maintain those cells in the center of the structure? So Jay just overexpressed BCL2 and BCLXL in order to block apoptosis and then followed the progression of uh, morphogenesis. And what he found was that for the first week after expression of BCL2 BCL, or BCLXL, that there was no apoptosis and the, the inner cells were intact. But then he happened to go, go back to the cultures and look at them a few days later and found that they were completely hollow, even though there was no evidence that there was a breach in, in, um, which allowed apoptosis. So we wondered what was responsible for this um, later stage clearing of the, of, the inner, of the luminal cells. And one thing that Jay noticed is by in doing transmission electron microscopy, that the cells in the center of the structure, and these are the outer cells, and these are the inner cells, were just loaded with autophagic vesicles and autophagolysosomes. So autophagy is a process that's activated um, to a great extent when cells are starving. So he postulated that these cells may be starving, and that's one reason why they undergo this um, process. And you know, presumably this would lead eventually, if the, cell, if the starvation wasn't resolved, to a necrosis-like death. So he proposed that the cells would and then undergo necrosis like death. So after Jay left, um, we, I tried for a long time to find someone who was willing to, um, to trace the metabolic fate of these cells in the center to see if, in fact, they were starving and if there were metabolic defects associated with the cells in the center. And it actually took five years before I found someone who was willing to do that, and that was Zach Schaefer, who was a... Um, Student, uh, graduate student at Duke and his lab, they started working on some aspects of metabolism, so he was willing to take on the challenge. And then a graduate student, Alex Grossian, joined him. And to make a long story short, um, what he found, or so one thing is it's difficult to follow metabolism in a three-dimensional structure. And since all of the lines of evidence we had was that the cells in the center were undergoing these, uh, eventually underwent apoptosis because they were not receiving integrin signals from the outside, he started by just looking at metabolic defects associated with survival of cells in suspension without attachment to matrix. And using a whole variety of different experiments, um, uh, he found that, in fact, 
that when cells are not attached to matrix, they're unable to transport, or they, there's a dramatic decrease in both glucose and amino acid uptake. And this then, when he followed it by flux studies, led to a significant decrease in glycolysis and um, TCA cycle as well as pentose phosphate cycle, flux through the pen, pentose phosphate pa pathway, significant reduction in ATP, and an induction of reactive oxygen species. So one question was, um, would there be a similar, would there be similar changes in the three-dimensional structures? And we really um, couldn't look at ATP at that time. Now there's some imaging approaches that make that, make that somewhat feasible. Um, what we did was to work with uh, Lo Ling Song, who was a two-photon microscopist, and just looked at this really early stage before there was any sign of any um, uh, cell death. <clears throat> looked by two-photon microscopy, which allowed us to look at the, just the overall levels of NADH and NADPH. And you could see that there was a dichotomy between the inner and the outer cells. We didn't know what caused it, but we could see that there, was, there were differences in metabolic activity of these. But then when we used a stain that fluoresced in the presence of reactive oxygen species, DCFDA, you could see that the inner cells were loaded with um, reactive oxygen. So this suggested that perhaps the same kind of events were going on. And then um, to address whether the um, reactive oxygen contributed to the elimination of the cells, um, Jay stained, I mean, um, uh, Zach treated the cells with several different antioxidants, and sure enough, treatment with uh, N-acetylcysteine or Trolox blocked the death of those cells in the center of the structure, suggesting that Ross was actually responsible for the elimination of those cells. And then he actually went on to show that, in fact, um, what was known at the time from Craig Thompson's lab is that if cells were attached to matrix and you starved them intentionally of glucose and amino acids, they would survive because they would upregulate fatty acid oxidation. So they'd use fatty acids as a substrate instead of um, amino acids and glucose. And what, what we found was that in suspension, the cells were unable to upregulate fatty acid oxidation. So basically, they were starved for glucose, amino acids, and they couldn't use fatty acids. Um, and in fact, under conditions which we treated with antioxidants that rescued fatty acid oxidation and the cells survived. So it all suggested that it was actually Ross was, was specifically allowing the elimination of cells that were starved of glucose and amino acid when they're outside of their natural environment. So we think this is kind of a homeostatic process that's part of, the, um, part of um, uh, nature's way of eliminating cells that are outside of their natural matrix, I mean, outside of their natural environment. Now, apoptosis is the most rapid way to do that, but then when apoptosis is faulty, ROS is like a backup mechanism to get rid of those aberrant cells. We were interested in whether this was in, had anything to do with natural events, and so um, we um, looked at a process that we believe might mimic the process that we saw in the, in the three-dimensional structures, which is the formation of a lumen in the pubertal mammary gland. So in the pubertal mam mammary gland, you have these branches that um, elongate to form the, the ductal system, the virgin ductal system. And at the, the way in which these branches form is that there's proliferation at the tip. These tips are called terminal end buds. So you're continually adding cells here which basically creates a solid mass. And in order to have the duct, you have to eliminate these cells. And um, Jeff Rosen's lab showed many years ago that uh, he, or he proposed that the lumen was formed by apoptosis um, because he saw evidence of apoptosis just on the inside of these terminal end buds. And so we had found in, the, um, in our three-dimensional structures that a pro-apoptotic protein called BIM um, was necessary for clearing of the luminal space by apoptosis. And so we got BIM knockout mice from Andreas Strasser and then looked at the um, clearance of the lumen in the BIM knockout mice. Okay, and this was done by Andro, and Arnaud Melieu, who was a postdoc in the lab. And so basically, um, this is in a BIM wild type. You have this uh, clearance in apoptosis. Um, and I said, mentioned if you overexpress BCL2 or if you knock down BIM, you prevent apoptosis. And what the results were really striking. We actually didn't expect this because there's, <clears throat> there's other BH3 only proteins that could potentially be involved. But basically, 93% of the terminal end buds were 
solid clubs. There was no um, clearing of the luminal space at all. But what we found was interesting is that eventually there was clearance of the luminal space. And if you look by H&E, what you, we saw was that just at the point where the um, outer cells, the luminal cells polarize, and basically they lose their adhesive surface, that that isolated the cells that were in the center. And they eventually just underwent what looked like a necrotic type death. And if you stained with a antibody against four HNEs, which is a, a lipid peroxide product that um, is, is um, generated under conditions of high reactive oxygen, you see that there is very high levels of um, lipid peroxidation in these cells in the center. So we proposed that they were undergoing um, a ROS-mediated cell death. So very similar to what we had seen in the, um, in the BCL2 um, expressing cells you know, over time. So we think that this process of elimination by necrosis due to likely starvation, so after these cells are kind of isolated, when, <clears throat> when the outer cells polarize, they're likely deprived of, of nutrients, probably growth factors as well, and this leads to this necrotic-like death. So this is likely you know, why a number of sculpting events still occur under conditions in, in, the, in mice where you block um, apoptosis because this other mechanism takes over. So again, it suggests that it's an alternate backup to ensure natural morphogenesis under um, conditions in which the most, um, the, uh, most physiologic means of eliminating those cells is disrupted. Okay, so basically that suggested, that what that suggested to us was that in order for um, tumor or initiating you know, early tumor cells to be able to fill the luminal space, that you, they would have to have an anti-apoptotic insult to prevent apoptosis, but then they would have an, they need another um, event that would rescue the metabolic impairment of those cells that were, um, which did not die by apoptosis. So we looked at a lot of different oncogenes and um, to see which oncogenes were capable of, of, of conferring these different activities and, you know, and like had been shown by many people, um, the ERK, P. kinase, NF kappa B pathway, when super activated, say by constitutive activation, or mutants that lead to constitutive activation, we could prevent apoptosis. But interesting, of the ones that we looked at, only those oncogenes that activated the PI3 kinase AKT pathway were able to rescue the metabolic impairment. And what we found was that the reason that they were able to rescue the cells um, the metabolic impairment is, as I mentioned before, the cells, um, when they're detached from matrix, they can't transport glucose or glutamine. However, when there's an activated PI3 kinase pathway, this leads to constitutive activation of AKT, which is required for glucose and glutamine transport. So if you, you prevent, if you, when the cells are detached, you don't get activation of PI3 kinase because you need integrin signals to, um, to um, co-activate the, the, the PI3 kinase pathway with the EGF receptor activation, but when you activate AKT, you rescue the need for integrins, and so the cells can transport glucose and glutamine, glucose and glutamine so they're rescued. Um, and then what we found as well is that any oncogenes that led to constitutive activation of the PI3 kinase AKT pathway would also go rescue the metabolic impairment. So we think this is one reason why the PI3 kinase pathway is so commonly activated in cancer, because it not only is a very strong, not only confers very strong anti-apoptotic activity, but also um, can rescue this metabolic impairment. Okay, so what are the, the implications of this for early development? So one we would propose is that when there's a hyperproliferative insult that leads to uh, hyperproliferation of the cells, this would, um, the cells would proliferate in the center of the structure, and those, those cells that proliferate in the center of the structure would undergo apoptosis. If there was an insult that prevent, that um, an anti-apoptotic checkpoint, or an apoptotic checkpoint was lost, the cells would survive but we would propose that they would be metabolically impaired due to lack of nutrients, and they would undergo cell death. Um, and so the abnormal cells would die. So you have both of these, these checkpoints intact to prevent cancer from developing. Now, um, what we would then surmise is that, or propose is that oncogenes like ERB2 and PI3 kinase prevent apoptosis and they rescue the metabolic defects. So they would theoretically allow survival but 
we also, and I also mentioned that both of these um, oncogenes are known to increase the levels of cellular ROS because of effects on, on cellular metabolism. So there's also ROS that's induced um, to some extent by oncogenes as well. And I'm just mentioning this because it appears, so one would pr propose then that in, in this context where you don't have a strong oncogene that's uh, rescuing the, the um, metabolic impairment, that act up regulation of antioxidants could prevent the ROS killing. But we, <clears throat> and even in the context in which you have activation of oncogenes, there's evidence suggesting that there still may be a selection for up, uh, cells that have upregulated antioxidant gene expression programs. So ROS wouldn't be generated because of, of the lack of the nutrients, but it would be generated by other metabolic consequences of having these on activated oncogene pathways. So in either case, there's, there's selective pressure potentially or posed for um, um, upregulation of antioxidants. Um, then lead to tumor progression. So we published this paper around 2009, and we got a lot of kind of um, negative um, feedback because this seemed to challenge the um, dogma at the time that antioxidants are tumor suppressants. And this was because um, ROS is also known to induce DNA damage and mutation, so it also, ROS can also contribute to initiation of tumors by inducing DNA damage um, and then leading to tumor initiation. And so what we're proposing, um, that is if you, oh, and so if you block ROS with antioxidants, this could prevent tumor initiation. Um, but what we're proposing is that after tumors are initiated, antioxidants would not be suppressive, but actually be promoting for tumor progression. And since this time, there's lots of evidence now that indicates that following tumor initiation, that antioxidants can be strong um, promoters of tumor progression. I'm just going to mention a few things here. So one of, there have been multiple multiple um, epidemiologic studies similar to the one that I show here. So this was a trial in, that enrolled 35,000 men um, in which they were treated with vitamin E or placebo, and then they looked at the, um, um, the induction of, of, of prostate cancer. And what you can see is you didn't see much at first, but then this, the, they separated very significantly, and those patients, or those men on the study, that had vitamin E had a higher incidence of cancer. And there have been several other large epidemiologic studies that support this as well. So this epidemiologic evidence that antioxidants can be pro-tumorigenic. Um, and then uh, there have been multiple mouse models. I'm just going to show you two here. This was a very direct assessment of, of dietary supplementation with antioxidants. So this is a um, study from the Burgo lab where they took a BRAF um, lung tumor model, BRF mutant lung tumor model. So this is the normal incidence of cancer, and this is the incidence of cancer when they the mice were fed either N-acetylcysteine or vitamin E. So you can see there's a very significant um, acceleration of tumor progression. And then this is a study from Dave Tuvison's lab where he did the opposite. So um, he, they, their lab had found that KRAS activated NRF2, which is a transcription factor that's kind of known to be the major, regulate the major antioxidant transcriptional program. So it activates multiple um, anti, uh, uh, antioxidant programs, as well as other xenobiotic detoxification programs. So they found in their, in their pancreatic model, KRES activated NRF2. So they wondered whether NRF2 was contributing to tumor progression. So they crossed their KRES mutant um, mouse with um, either NR, uh, with NRF2, um, um, NRF2 knockout mice and found that, this should be minus minus, <laughs> um, there was a dramatic inhibition or, of tumor progression. So when they block the antioxidant program, they block tumor progression, which would support the idea antioxidants are pro-tumorigenic. And then the best evidence for a really critical role of antioxidants in some tumors is the evidence that this, um, these three genes that regulate the stability of NRF2, and they're the, the major regulators of, of NRF2 um, stability and nuclear localization, that there are mutations in NRF2, KEEP, and CUL3 
that lead to stabilization of NRF2 and activation of this whole program. And multiple tumor types show a fairly significant level of mutation. And these are generally um, tumors that are in the airway, like the lung, both adeno and squamous, and then other squamous tumors that are exposed to um, air um, along, the, you know, along the airway. So this is really the best evidence that upregulation of antioxidants can be tumor promoting. So there's lots of you know, people studying this, these um, NRF2 mutant, uh, or these mice that are defective in the NRF, or have a hyperactivated NRF2 to identify ways of, of blocking it. Okay, um, but there's um, evidence suggesting that NRF2 mutations in the NRF2 axis aren't the only way of, of regulating um, antioxidant programs. I just show you here. There are no mutations in NRF2 called 3 or KEEP in breast tumors, but you can see here, this is just Isaac Harris, who's a postdoc in the lab, made a list of 150 different positive or negative regulators of, of oxidative stress. And you can see that and <clears throat> the um, basal triple negative breast tumors have high levels of antioxidants and low levels of the um, pro-oxidants. HER2 tumors are also high. So there are other mechanisms that lead to activation of, of um, antioxidant programs in addition to NRF2. Okay, so then just overall, that's kind of the end of my introduction, there are multiple different um, 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 aspects or features of the process of tumor genesis that involve the generation of ROS. So tumors upregulate antioxidant programs to prevent unopposed ROS and cell death. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to talk about the unpublished work that um, was in the title. So um, what I'm going to tell you about is a completely, you know, unexpected player that plays a role in regulating oxidative stress, stress. and this involves um, the TRIP-A1 calcium channels. And this work was totally uh, initiated and driven by um, a Japanese postdoc, Nobu Takahashi. And Nobu is a neurobiologist who worked on um, TRIP-A1 channels both as a postdoc, I mean as a graduate student, and later as a, in a first postdoc in the Mori lab in Japan. So, why was he interested in looking at TRIP-A1? Why did he come to our lab? Um, so TRIP-A1 is a member of the, of, um, the TRIP, trip, um, uh, TRIP channel family. These proteins are expressed in sensory neurons, and they're responsive to a whole variety of different stimuli that lead to activation of the channel and, opening, and, and, and calcium influx. <clears throat> so the TRIP channels are particularly interesting, interesting interesting um, with respect to oxidative stress because they have four cysteines in the cytoplasmic tail which when oxidized or reacted with electrophilic agents lead to opening of the channel. So he was interested in, uh, so this was of interest and with respect to oxidative stress. Um, just mention a few other things. Um, so though you may not know it, you are familiar with um, the consequences of trip A1 activation. So wasabi. Uh, and mustard oil, the major comp the, com the component of those that give it the strong, um, uh, strong flavor, a strong irritant, is actually AITC, which is a strong um, it, it reacts with the uh, the cysteines to activate the channel. It's also involved in neurogenic inflammation and asthma, and so it's believed to be responsible for activation or for release of of um, inflammatory model. Mo molecules at the, at the nerve um, airway interface that leads to the continual irritation associated with asthma. And there's actually companies that are developing inhibitors of TRIP-A1 for treatment of asthma. So it's actually a, you know, an interesting molecule from many other, uh, other respects. And then also, these channels are actually responsible for the pain that's associated with certain chemotherapies and aromatase inhibitors. So these inhibitors actually react with these cysteines leading to the induction of the pain sensation. So it's a very interesting molecule. Most of you probably came into this um, seminar a little leery about whether you'd really be interested in trip A1, but it is an interesting molecule. Okay, 
So Nobu was interested in coming to our lab because TRIP-A1 is actually upregulated in multiple epithelial tumors. And in particular, it's upregulated in lung, I mean in um, kidney, and sorry, in breast tumors as well as kidney tumors and lung tumors. And if you look at the, its expression specifically in breast tumors, so these are normal breast, and this is invasive ductal breast carcinomas. This is from the TCA, TCGA data. And this is separated into the different PAM50 subclasses of breast tumors. You can see that there isn't any specific subclass of breast tumors in which it's specifically upregulated. So it's upregulated in many. And this is just a larger panel of different TRIP mutants. So you can see that TRIP-A1 is the most commonly upregulated, although um, you can see that uh, the trip, one of the other TRIP-M channels is, is also upregulated in, specifically in basal tumors. So um, Nobu was interested in whether the protein was expressed, so he got the antibody from the, um, from the human protein atlas a collection that had been very va highly validated by them, but then he actually knocked out TRIP-A1 in a breast tumor cell line, made tumors, um, and then use those to validate the antibody. And it validated very nicely. Um, you see very low levels in normal breast. But then in breast tumors, there were a reasonable portion of the tumors that were 3 plus, but then and also we saw 2 plus staining. Um, so there was a significant upregulation of the protein as well as the RNA in breast tumors. And then he also looked in um, a, a tissue microarray of lung squamous and lung adenotumors. And again, the protein expression correlated with the RNA expression. So it looked like the protein was expressed as well. Um, and then to just show you, um, this is a, a series of, of different PDX models models that we have in the lab. Most of them are from Alana Welm. This is from um, Jeff Shapiro and um, Gene Zhang at Harvard. Um, but then when we looked at tumor cell lines, there was basically only one tumor cell line that had really high levels of expression um, and just low levels in, in other ones. And I can go into this during the question period. I don't have a lot of time to tell you about this. But what we found is that, that TRIP-A1 is actually a downstream target of NRF Two, and it's also activated by a variety of different um, irritants and stimuli. Like TNF activates it about 400 fold. It's also activated by just oxidative stress. This shows its upregulation by oxygen. So we think one reason why we're not seeing it as commonly upregulated in culture is that it's likely upregulated in the tumors under conditions where there is oxidative stress um, or potentially other other um, other um, factors like TNF that could lead to its activation. Okay, I just wanted to mention one other one. Here's my, uh, I'm, I have two genetic slides. Um, so another tumor that had very high levels were these um, malignant peripheral ner nerve sheath tumors, or MPNST, and there was actually 25-fold amplification um, in these tumors. Other amplification in others, we've looked really closely at the, at the breast. The amplification is pretty minimal, but it was more significant in the MPNSTs, and so we got, multi, uh, and also the level of RNA expression was significantly higher in the tumors, which we did not see in the breast. So it suggested that this was, you know, more meaningful, there are consequences of this activation. Um, Okay, so actually, I guess I left it out there, and I'll show you later. There are multiple, uh, there's upregulated in neural sheath tumor cell lines as well, and, and, and that, would cor that correlates with the amplification. Okay, so one really important question is, so it's overexpressed, the protein's there, but is it actually functional? Can it, can it, um, uh, um, can it, is it, does it function as a calcium channel? Um, oh, oh yeah, so it just, okay. Um, so what we did um, was to look at cell lines that overexpress TRIP-A1 and um, treated those cell lines with AITC, which is that wasabi uh, component that activates the TRIP-A1 channel, and then this looked in the different cell lines that have different levels of TRIP-A1. So you can see that this 1569s, which, have, uh, oops, which has high levels of TRIP-A1, there was <clears throat> significant um, uh, calcium influx after treatment with AITC, and then basically it the level of calcium influx correlated with the level of, of TRIP-A1 um, expression. Also looked at this in the um, lung tumor cell lines, and here's the MPNST cell lines. And again, if you 
if your eyes can follow the protein levels and the um, level of uh, calcium influx, you see that it directly correlates. So these channels are able to be activated um, in the, their functional channels in these tumor cell lines. Okay, so one question is, does, are there consequences of loss of expression of TRPA1 in the tumor cell lines? And so one of the things that, that um, Nobu did was to grow the cells in soft auger. So this is basically a measure of Anchorage independent proliferation and survival. And we actually know that there's ROS increase, as I showed you earlier, in cells that are in suspension. And what he found was that there was a very dramatic reduction in the number of colonies formed in soft auger in this breast tumor cell line, 1569, um, after in, with two different hairpins. But nicely, we could also treat this, this control cell line with the TRPA1 inhibitor. So I mentioned they're TRPA1 inhibitors. One thing great about this project is there's really good reagents, both inhibitors and stimulators of the channel that we had to work with. And so you can see that both the knockdown and the TRPA1 inhibitor dramatically reduced the survival of these cells um, in Anchorage independent conditions. Um, and this also just shows that um, you couldn't say for sure whether that was related to oxidative stress. In this case, um, Nobu treated the monolayers of cells with increasing concentrations of H2O2 and then measured survival. And here you, these are, I, I'm showing you this lung series here because you can see very, and we have so many of them, you can see the dose response um, to, um, sorry, this is in the presence or absence of a trpa one inhibitor. So in the presence, um, in the presence of inhibitor relative to the absence, you see much better survival under oxidative stress. So this just kind of confirmed that the cells were less sensitive to oxidative stress if the trip a one channel was functional. Okay, but what was really uh, kind of um, much more convincing to me was when I saw a more kind of natural, the natural context of uh, uh, activation of, of ROS. Okay, so what Nobu did was to take the 1569 cells, the breast line that has a high level expression, and he expressed a genetically encoded ROS sensor called HYPER2. And then he also monitored um, calcium influx using FURA2. And basically, if you just look at the control here, what was re really interesting is that these cells are surviving in the, these, the, you know, if you look at the levels of, of blue, which you, hard to see because the, um, the, the red and yellow are so strong, but there are cells present in, there are, there's a solid sphere of cells. And you can see this gradient of ROS from the outside to the inside. So even though the cells are surviving, there's an, increased, there's an increased gradient of ROS in those cells. And that corresponds to an increase in the level of calcium. So it looks like TRPA1 under condition, it's not like TRPA1 is present in the outer cells, but you don't see calcium influx. And there's a correlation between the level of ROS and the extent of calcium influx. And this looks real because if you knock down TRPA1 or if you inhibit TRPA1, you lose that FURA2 signal. So I think this is a really nice imaging um, uh, visualization of the uh, regulation of calcium influx by the TRPA1 channel that kind of correlates with ROS. Um, that's just a quant uh, Nobu has quantified all this. I'm not showing all the quantification because. He, there's so much data, but he's quantified all of these. Okay, so then important question is what happens to those cells when you knock down TRPA1 over time? And so this just, so what I showed you there was a day five after knockdown or treatment with the inhibitor. This is a day 10 and this is day 15. And one thing that you can see is that if you stain for caspase 3, a marker of apoptosis, in the, in the hairpin treated cells, there was um, increase apoptosis. But I think what's very convincing to me is when you look at just the DAPI stain itself after 15 days, and what you see is that the outer cells are complete, are surviving fine with TRPA1 knockdown, but basically every single acinus is empty, it's hollow. So it looks like when you knock down TRPA1, those cells that had the higher level of, trip, of um, ROS are undergoing cell death. But the in outer cells, which had very low levels of ROS and, and, and 
no calcium, they seem to be fine. There is a reduced um, uh, prolifer proliferation of those cells. We haven't really looked into that yet, but you can see the key 67 is down a bit. So this is in the 1569 cells. Uh, oh, shoot. I Pasted, I just added this because he's now done it on the, uh, I passed it in the wrong line. He's now done it on um, the uh, lung tumor cell lines and the PDX model, and you see similar clearing of the inner cell. So we're seeing it in multiple different cancer types that if the cells have high trip A1, then you see this reduction. We don't see that in cell, the cell lines that don't have high trip A1. Okay, so what I've shown you so far, trip A1's expressed at high levels in a subset of breast and lung tumors, PDX models, and that trip A1 is activated by natural conditions associated with ROS generation, and that downregulation of trip A1 in tumor cells suppresses colony formation and prevents survival of the inner cells in the spheroids. So we still weren't totally convinced, and so another kind of way of addressing this was to do the opposite experiment. And that was to take normal mammary epithelial cells and overexpress trip A1. And so would normal would overexpression of trip A1 allow survival of those cells that die in the center of the structure? Um, and so first, what Nobu did was he, he introduced trip A1 into the cells and then just looked to see if it would be a functional channel um, by treating with H2O2. And you can see this is just a single cell recording. You can see that trip A1 was able to be activated in the MCF10A normal epithelial cells when overexpressed. And so this, and this is just the, the collective data from, the, from lots of cells. So you see much sig more significant. If really high concentrations of H2O2, you start getting some calcium influx. But you see the dramatic difference with trip A1 overexpression. OK, so what happens in the asini? That was the critical question. So in the vector controls, you can see that um, there is a similar gradient. And these are, these are in early structures when you still have cells in the center. As, as we had seen with the DCFDA, you see an increase in ROS, a gradient of ROS. Um, and then if you overexpress trip A1, you see increased calcium influx in the cells in the center. And if you block. Um, with, if you block with um, the AP18, you see a reduction in that. But the critical question was, does the trip A1 overexpression allow survival of those cells in the center? And th that's addressed here. So with longer term culture, what you see is that in the cell, if you look at caspase 3, the cells that are overexpressing trip A1, I, I forgot to mention, we, there's one mutant, there's multiple mutants that mutations in trip A1 associated with breast cancer. And um, Nobu's colleagues in Japan made all those mutants. And only one of them actually had an activated phenotype. And it actually has a really interesting mutation, which predicts that it would have a stronger, a stronger um, uh, there would be a stronger, it would be easier, more readily activated by electrophilic attack. So anyway, it's better, it's better at everything with respect to um, activating the channel. And you can see that um, the cells in the center not only survive, but also can proliferate. And basically, you don't get this clearing of the luminal space to nearly to the extent that you get in the um, control structures when you overexpress trip A1. Um, oh, oh, yes. Yeah, so, oh, I just wanted to mention that, um, OK, this is a really important point. When you look at the, um, the levels of ROS, there, the, there's no decrease in the level of ROS in these cells that are surviving. And what we've, we've looked at this in many different ways. So trip A1 is not neutralizing ROS. So ROS is still present at the highest, at the similar level, but the cells are basically able to survive the insult of the ROS when the trip A1 channel, when, calcium, when you get calcium influx. Um, brought about by the trip A1 channel. Okay, so no decrease in ROS, but we get survival. Okay, all right, so this kind of just summarized. Um, so overexpression reduces the sensitivity of MCF10A cells to H2O2. It prevents the cells from death and suspension. It protects the inner cells in 3D. I, I didn't show you this, but we see this as well. And, but trip A1 does not neutralize ROS. So how's it working? Oh, OK, one other thing I wanted to mention before you show you how it works. So as I mentioned before, um, certain chemotherapies that are strong electrophiles um, are able to activate, whoops, 
are able to activate the um, to able to activate TRPA1. So basically, um, for instance, um, platinum drugs activate TRPA1. And so if you think about if a cell is high, has high expression of TRPA1, when you treat with a platinum drug, is the high levels of TRPA1 will potentially allow the cells to survive the, the insult of the, of the chemotherapy because it's able to um, activate these calcium channels and give protection to the oxidative stress. OK, so one question is, does TRPA1 protect cells from chemotherapeutic drugs that activate TRPA1? So the first question was, do, do, we, see carbo, do we see activation of TRPA1 in the breast tumor cells that express high levels of TRPA1? So does carboplatin activate TRPA1 in these cells? So if you look at the single cell recording, you can see that carboplatin does activate calcium influx. And if in the two cell lines that have TRPA1 knockdown or TRPA1 inhibition, you lose that. So it looks like TRPA1 is the only um, calcium channel that is able to be activated by carboplatin in this particular cell line. And that's just a quantification there. So then the question was, does, does this protect the cells from oxidative stress? And the way in which he addressed this was to treat with carboplatin at different, def, uh, just did a dose response curve with carboplatin and looked at the relative viability. In this particular um, cell line, you can see the shift of the curve. Um, so there is a, a highly statistically significant. He did this like innumerable times in order to be able to, in, in, in order to be sure of the result. But if you look in the lung cell lines and in the um, neural sheath tumor cell lines, which have a larger number of, of and higher expression, you can see that a much more significant shift, and it's totally uh, um, correlates with the level of expression of the um, TRPA1. So it looks like TRPA1 can protect these cells from um, carboplatin, and the, presumably because activation of the calcium channel is protecting these cells. And then um, Nobu ex addressed this in an experimental model. So he took the, H the HCC1569 cells, the breast tumor cell line, injected those cells either with that expressed uh, a control hairpin, as well as um, either the two different um, SHRNAs. And he then um, treated each one with or without carboplatin. So it turns out we didn't realize this, but HC 1569s are super resistant to carboplatin. So this is minus and plus carboplatin, basically resistant. If he just knocked down TRPA1, if you let those are these curves here, knockdown of TRPA1 allows the cells to grow better. I mean, they can't grow as well. So TRPA1 is likely contributing, or the protection against oxidative stress may be allowing the cells to grow faster. But then when you treated with carboplatin, you got an even more significant um, reduction in the growth of the cells, suggesting that um, TRPA1 was protecting the cells from um, carboplatin. Um, induced cell death. And then also you see an increase in, in um, caspase 3 in this window of time at the time that they were harvested. So this supports the idea that trip A1 in vivo could also be protective, not only in terms of tumor growth, but also in the context of carboplatin. And I, I just show you this. It wasn't a very meaningful experiment. He also took the PDX model that had high levels of trip A1. Um, it turns out that the, they're very sensitive to carboplatin. So this is carboplatin alone. And there was a reduction. Um, it was statistically significant because he used a lot of mice. He used 10 different mice for each of the arms of this experiment. One thing that, so you know, we really can't draw too many conclusions from this. Oh, in this case, he used a, the inhibitor of, he wanted to do the experiment with an inhibitor of TRPA1. So he used a TRPA1 inhibitor. It has a half-life of only two hours. So he had to dose several times a day. And it was a really unpleasant experiment to run. So it's too bad that it turns out this tumor is so um, sensitive. One thing he did notice is that in the combo treatment, there was, a, it, <clears throat> there was a lot more, even though the tumor size was similar, there was a lot more stroma. And the stroma comes in when you get loss of cells. So suggested that there might be a more significant effect than seen here. But we need to do, 
we, first of all, we need much better inhibitors, so we're hoping the drug companies are going to come up with better ones. And then also, um, we need to use a model that's less sensitive to um, carboplatin in order to be able to address this better. Okay. All right. So then, how does trip A1 work? How is it allowing survival of cells even in the context of, of high reactive oxygen? So um, no, Nobu has done literally, I think, thousands of assays for this, and I'm going to spare you most of those. I'm just going to show you a few representative slides. But basically, we collaborated with Gordon Mills, who has this beautiful RPPA platform that allows you to look at about 300 different cellular proteins or phosphoproteins um, in order to monitor pathway activation. And so Nobu has looked in MCF10A cells with or without TRIP-A1, with or without H2O2 and 2D culture, or with or without suspension culture. And then he took the breast and lung tumor cell lines, incubated them with or without TRIP-A1 hair hairpin or AP18 in order to get the full spectrum of pathway activation. And so, again, it's actually getting late, so I, I'm just going to show you that we do have lots of data, and it was, very, it, was, it was very robust, the data, because we saw very similar effects under all those different conditions, either gain of function or loss of function, which implicated multiple signaling pathways downstream that were activated by TRIP-A1 under conditions in which it was specifically activated by oxidative stress. And so you can see here there's activation of both the ERK and the, and the PI3 kinase pathway. When he just here visualized all the pro and anti-apoptotic proteins, you can see that the strongest upregulation of anti-apoptotic proteins were, were um, MCL1. We also saw BCLXL upregulated as well. And again, you can see it it's under conditions of H2O2 or detached. And the way he visualized this data is to show the ratio, this is the ratio of the activate or the the antibody signal in the in the H2O treated cells in trip A1 expressors versus not. This isn't the signal with H2O2 alone. It's relative to the MCF10A cells that aren't expressing trip A1. And then in parallel, he did the knockdown experiments. And again, the data supported the loss of activation of the same pathways that were activated by overexpression of MCF10A of uh, of TRIP-A1, and you can see here that both MCL1 and BCL-XL were down under conditions in which TRIP-A1 was knocked down in either the breast or the lung tumor cell lines. Um, and just um, one experiment that Nobu did was to address the role of MCL1, and you can actually just look here. So in the control cells, if you just um, use an MCL1-specific inhibitor, does that affect the survival of the cells in the center? And you can see these are in the um, H, this is in the HCC 1569 cells that you lose um, the inner cells under conditions in which you um, inhibit MCL1. And these are just the trip A1 controls where you also lose it. And this is the quantification. So MCL1 does appear to be a critical mediator of survival of these cells in the center. Um, okay, so this just kind of summarizes what he found. I didn't go over all this data, but what he sees is an increase in GTP loading of RAS, which is consistent with seeing both the ERK and the PI3 kinase um, and mTOR pathway activated. Um, and I'm just showing, this is like, this is just to impress you. <laughs> <laughs> but he did lots of assays. Not only did he do this in culture, but recently, in order to address the reviewer's question whether this happens in vivo, he did it on all the tumor cells. So I have an equal number of panels from all the tumor cells showing um, this pathway. OK, so how does, how does activation of trip or calcium activate the um, RAS pathway? And through a lot of experiments with knockdown inhibitors, et cetera, which I have whole another set of slides that I'm not going to show you. It turns out that calmodulin is essential as well as PIC2. And it turns out that um, PIC2 in the firm domain, which is this is the, the closest relative to FAC, the inner uh, focal adhesion kinase, it has a firm domain that binds to calmodulin. And the um, FAC, its closest relative, does not. So, PIC2 is activated by calcium calmodulin, and then this leads to activation of these pathways in a very significant way, leading to MCL1 activation. So the, the, so the premise is that the reason why these cells can survive um, in um, the 
insult of ROS is because of strong anti-apoptotic um, uh, pathways that are activated by calcium. And just kind of as an aside, and I didn't have, I didn't have, I knew I wouldn't have time to go into this, that I think in general the cancer f field of cancer ignores calcium um, to a great extent, not everyone, there are papers on it, but um, there's, a <clears throat> there's reason to believe that, um, that because of data like this, that in influx of calcium can have a very really strong anti-apoptotic and likely contributes to the survival of cancer cells in ways that really haven't been explored to the extent that they should be. Okay, so basically, just to summarize, um, there are multiple, uh, as I mentioned, multiple pathways that lead to induction of ROS. And so, you know, the, what we know from previous work is that most of the antioxidant programs function by neutralizing ROS, and we just are distinguishing the TRIPA-1 protection from ROS because in this case we're not neutralizing ROS, but it's allowing the cells to tolerate ROS. So as I mentioned before, what we found recently, and again, I couldn't, didn't have time to add it, is that TRIPA-1 is activated by NRF2, so that would indicate NRF2 is both neutralizing ROS as well as cleaning up by um, actually providing an additional mechanism of allowing the cells to tolerate any ROS that's not neutralized. Okay, so just like what are the therapeutic implications of this? Um, so these data suggest that counteracting antioxidants can enhance therapies associated with ROS. So many different therapies lead to an increase in level of ROS. And so um, resistance to these mechanisms have been shown to and, and probably like more likely than we realize are associated with upregulation of antioxidants. So could targeting antioxidants increase the sensitivity to these standard of care reagents? So you know, how would you do that? And so we would suggest that potentially one mechanism would be to inhibit TRIPA-1, and we're hoping that these inhibitors of TRIPA-1 um, uh, are, have better pharmacokinetic properties so that they can be, uh, they could be more effective um, in, in treatment. We're thinking one thing, we're talking to radiation um, oncologists because we think radiation might be a really good approach to start with because you wouldn't have the combined effects of trip A1 inhibition plus chemotherapy, but potentially sensitize the cells without um, significant systemic effects of, of um, of, of chemotherapy, so we think that would be an interesting approach to look at. Clearly, lots of people now are looking for ways of suppressing the antioxidant consequences um, of NRF2, both in tumors that have mutations in the NRF2 axis, as well as other tumors that upregulate NRF2 um, um, as a result of other, like uh, RAS activation. And then there's some really interesting data from Stuart Schreiber's lab and a group at, um, McMahon's group at, um, UCSF suggesting that the antioxidant GPX4, which specifically neutralizes lipid peroxidase, may be, criti may be um, a critical enzyme to maintain the viability of mesenchymal persister cells that persist after treatment with a whole variety of different targeted and chemotherapies. Um, and then a lot of people are looking at blocking glutathione production um, by inhibiting the, glut the critical limit rate limiting step in glutathione production. And then lastly, I'm sorry for being over, um, just important consideration in all this is that while antioxidants may promote cancer, they also are important in preventing aging and other associated diseases. So obviously one has to find, as we have to do with all um, cancer therapies, find the right balance. And you know, we would propose that it's really critical to understand the mechanisms involved in antioxidant promotion of cancer and inhibition of aging phenotypes so that we could find more specific mechanisms um, that would potentially not, uh, in which we wouldn't have the secondary consequences of of, of inhibition of antioxidants with aging and other associated diseases. We think TRIP-A1 might be one such, um, one such mechanism. And then I'd just like again to um, acknowledge Nobu who was just, uh, he's the real hero of this. He works seven days a week, 16 hours a day. Doesn't get to see that little guy, I think, very often. Um, and several people in our lab actually contributed to these studies and we have important collaborations with all these people. I think I mentioned a lot of them, most especially Gordon Mills because the RPPA was so critical in identifying the pathway that was responsible for this and acknowledged funding from several different organizations. Thank you very much. <laughs>
thank you, Joan, for that really uh, terrific talk. And, and we got an extra bonus of a few extra minutes, too, which is always great. Uh, <laughs> Thanks you know, for making me feel uh, Well, I, I, I'm guilty of that myself uh, sometimes, <laughs> as some of the audience knows. Uh, so in any case, uh, just as a token of our appreciation of, of your giving this fantastic talk, uh, we have this uh, plaque uh, <laughs> to bestow upon you. This falls within all government requirements sure. in terms of yeah. the, you know the the value. It's it's from a sentimental point of view extremely valuable, uh, but uh, falls within all guidelines and monetary. I promise uh, not value. to eat it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I know you can't give me food. <laughs> so anyway, uh, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. All right, and so I think we have uh, a little bit of time for some questions. Uh, do we have any questions from the, uh, the group? Uh, yeah, yeah, Alejandro. When the TRPA1 channel is open and excess calcium ions enter the cell, is there a secondary effect on calcium uh, movement across the endoplasmic reticulum membrane? You know, we, we, we can't see that with fear too, so, and we haven't explored it. Um, so I can't answer that question specifically. I know that if you give really high concentrations of AITC, that it will go, it will go into the mitochondria and you'll get death. So, you know, tip, typically it's self-limited. You get these oscillations, but if you use too high a concentration, you will. But I can't, and we haven't followed the ER yet. Are there any other calcium channels that might work in conjunction with, with the uh, TRPA1? So if you, you know, the, some of those first slides, there are trip, other trip channels that are, um, that are activated or that are overexpressed. We looked at trip M and we don't see any activation under the conditions that we've looked at. But I, you know, there's so many different stimulants of those different receptors and there's a couple of papers in the literature suggesting that there can be survival um, um, benefit from others, but mechanisms haven't been worked out yet. So, um, and then there's, you know, trip, I mean, not trip channels, but muscarinic receptors are overexpressed in lung cancer and stimulated by acetylcholine, and acetylcholine is produced in the tumors, and there's evidence that vagal nerve stimulation can be protective in the, um, in the, uh, in um, the gut tumors. So I th think there's, there's a lot more out there that needs to be learned. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really interesting talk, John. So it looks like TRIP-A1 has a sort of an outsized function uh, in 3D cultures, and that's probably why it might have been missed by a lot of the regular screens in 2Ds. So um, in this context, do you see a synergistic effect of TRIP-A1 inhibitor with ERK inhibitor, uh, MEK inhibitor, for example, in the KRAS mutant lung cancer, or with PR3 kinase inhibitor in PCSUA or P10 mutant tumor cells? So we haven't looked at that, um, although I, I think that my, since we get total clearance when we knock down TRIPA1 or inhibit it, I think that we would see that, but it would just, we would accelerate the clearance, I think. And that, we probably should do that. I think that we just have to do it temporally because we do end up with hollow, hollow spheres. But I think, I bet we would because that would be eliminating one of the pathways that's most protective. We also haven't looked at um, which pathway controls MCL1. In the literature, it looks like PI3 kinase controls um, MCL1, so uh, that would be predicted. Other questions? So I have a, a question which may be totally off the wall, but I'll ask it anyway, <laughs> and, and that is, have you looked at all in terms of gas dermin mediated uh, cell death uh, in these systems? And the reason I raise that question is that there's at least some evidence that uh, cisplatinum uh, may act uh, to kill cells uh, by activating, I think it's gastermin E uh, rather than gastermin D, which can be activated by the inflammasome, which can be activated by reactive ox oxygen species. So I'm just, you know, trying to put these the other whole items. loop. Yeah, trying I mean, to we put don't these have to together. implicate anything else because those cysteines themselves are reactive. Um, but that's not to say that there couldn't be something else that would contribute as well. Yeah, well, I'm thinking of the gas German as being the executioner of the cell, you know, so that 
so that you'd have... Oh, when we when we knock down trip A1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, I actually never thought about it. We could look at that. Yeah, I That's, mean, it's I, an interesting... Uh, 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 Feng Xiao has been working on the, the guest Germans guest and, German. and uh, you know, the role of guest Germans in, in uh, cell death from chemotherapy. And, you know, it, it just... There's some things of what you talked about that, you know, sort of yeah, fit actually, into that Yeah, we should look picture. at that. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Huh. Okay, other okay. questions? All right, if not, thank you so, so much. Thank you for coming. <laughs>